hope you're having a great week or weekend. I'm Andrea M and this is the Oz Files The Truth Is Out Back. And as a lead into a new segment soon to be added to the channel, Unsolved Down Under, today's Oz Files will be delving into Australia's top 10 unsolved mysteries, which I will be going into in greater depth on an Unsolved Down Under very soon. So please stay tuned for that. But before we look into today's stories, look, oh God, Louie! I think Louie wants to be on camera. When I finally got him on camera, it's Mr. Louie. <laughs> he looks really impressed. Can I say hello, everybody? On today's Oz Files, it's all about mysteries and missing things and all that stuff that Mum seems to like. <laughs> I was so happy he wanted to come and be on here with me today because I've never got him on camera before. <laughs> He looks so impressed. Okay, so now Louis made his little appearance. Let's just get back into what we were talking about. So, where were we? Okay, so all of the mysteries that will be looked at a little bit today will be looked into in greater depth on Unsolved Down Under, so stay tuned for that. But before we look into today's stories, look who's back. We have Charlie and we have his best mate, Oogie. Oog loves it here so much he's decided to stay, so I look forward to he and our recent Clown Motel graduate Charles Danvers Esquire, top of his class in Haunting the Living, to be appearing in more Oz Files videos together with me. And they would also like to let you guys know if you're into unsolved mysteries, missing persons, real crime, disasters and a little of the paranormal thrown in just for good measure, then you found just the channel for you because that's mainly all that we do here. So they would also like to ask you very nicely to kidnap the like button, haunt the subscribe button and ring the magic bell to summon us at 3am and to share the creepy goodness around and also drop a comment or two below and let us know your thoughts on today's video or if you would like to suggest something you might like to see us cover in the future, please do so. It's subscribers like you who help creators like me thrive on YouTube and continue to bring you content just like this. Without further ado, let's begin the countdown. So Australia might not have a long history, but we do have something of a mysterious one. And the more I research into these videos, the more I seem to be finding. So here are our top 10 unsolved Australian mysteries. Number one, the disappearance of Rihanna Baru. Location, South Australia, the date, October 1992. In October of 1992, 12-year-old Rihanna Baru was walking to her local mall in South Australia to buy a card for a pen pal in America. She couldn't catch the bus because the drivers were all on strike, so her mother agreed she could walk, saying goodbye to her as she went off to work. Witnesses would then see Rihanna walking along the highway drive just before noon, and that would be the last that anybody would see of Rihanna Baru. When Rihanna's mum arrived home in the afternoon, she would find the card that her daughter wanted to purchase for her pen pal laying on the dining room table. She would also find a record laying on the floor, and she would also find a TV playing very loudly in an empty room. She called for her daughter, but nobody replied. She searched, but there was nothing. Frantic, she would then call the police. Now, almost 25 years later, there are still no answers for Rihanna's mother as to what happened to her daughter. In 2015, a $1 million reward was offered for any credible information, but still nobody has come forward. Rihanna's mother still lives in the same home, hoping that one day her daughter might return or that she'll get some answers as to what happened to her. If you have any information on the disappearance of Rihanna Baru, please call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Number 2. The Case of Mr Cruel The location Melbourne, the date, the late 80s and the early 1990s. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, an unknown serial pedophile and sexual assaultist had the people of Melbourne terrified. He was known by the media as Mr. Cruel and with good reason. In August of 1987, he broke into a Lower Plenty family home armed and tied up both parents and their son. Then their 11-year-old daughter was attacked. 
In 1998, he broke into a home in Ringwood, kidnapped 10-year-old Sharon Wells and held her for an horrific 18 hours before releasing her. He struck again in 1990, breaking into a Canterbury home and abducting 13-year-old Nicola Linus, whom he held and abused for 50 hours before releasing her. It was in 1991 he would strike his killing blow, although some experts have expressed doubt that Mr. Cruel was behind the killing, although it certainly matches his M.O. It was April of 1991, and a man armed with a knife abducted 13-year-old Carmen Chen, and a year later her body was found with three gunshot wounds. Her murder to this day remains unsolved. In working to solve the case of Mr. Cruel, police have searched some 30,000 homes based on the kidnapped girl's descriptions and interviewed around 27,000 suspects. There is currently a $300,000 reward available for information that leads to an arrest, but police have admitted that some vital evidence which may provide DNA proof has unfortunately gone missing. But if you have anything you can tell the police about Mr. Cruel, please call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Number three, the serial killings at Tai Nong North. Location, West Gippsland, Victoria, during the 1980s. So a man was dumping animal remains in Tai Nong North in December of 1980, and he comes across what seems to him to be some suspicious looking bones. To him, they looked human and he called the police. The police would then go on to uncover the remains of three women and two years later, a fourth victim is found in the same area. The fourth victim was a woman named Narimal Stevenson who disappeared just a month before the remains were first found. Other victims were 14-year-old Catherine Headland and 73-year-old Bertha Miller, both of whom disappeared in August of 1980 and they were found missing some 18 days apart, an 18-year-old Anne-Marie Sargent who went missing in October of the same year. Over the next three decades, police named several suspects and even linked the time on North serial killings to two more murders in Frankston. But none have ever been solved. Despite an in-depth investigation by teams of police officers, they don't even know whether the killer is a single person or on a team of murderers. And the next one you'll be quite familiar with if you have been a continual watcher, and it is at number four, the disappearance of Frederick Valenich, location Bass Strait, date October 1978. Frederick Valenich, a 20-year-old pilot in training, was on a 235-kilometre training flight over the Bass Strait in October of 1978. His aircraft was a light plane, a Cessna 182L, and Valenich had around 150 total hours of flying time. His intention was to have a career in aviation, but admittedly he had a poor past achievement record, having failed twice the five commercial licence examination subjects and he was also rejected from the Royal Australian Air Force. On this flight, however, something was wrong. Valenich radioed to the Melbourne Air Traffic Control and reported that he was being followed by an aircraft. At around 1,000 feet, 300 metres above him, he reported that an aircraft was large, unknown to him and moving at an extremely high speed. Not long after, he radioed in to say that it was now orbiting above him and that it had a shiny metal surface and a green light. The controller asked Valenich to identify the aircraft and he sent his last communication. It isn't an aircraft. Then there was the sound of metal scraping and Valenich was never heard from again. A sea and air search was launched looking for the wayward pilot or any sign of his plane, but despite spanning over 1,000 square miles, nothing was found. Search efforts ceased four days later. Many theories have been suggested as to why Valenich reported what he did. Some say that he likely saw a UFO and others suggested he was confused and simply made an error. And it looks like we'll never know. And if you've never watched the Oz Files before, I have an entire video dedicated to the UFO phenomena and the disappearance of Frederick. So I will link that video in the description below if you have not seen it yet. At number five, we have Lassiter's Lost Reef. 
Likely one of the most well-known and enduring of Australia's unsolved mysteries, Lassiter's Reef has entertained and eluded decades of searchers. It started in 1929 and again in 1930 when Harold Bell Lassiter made a number of conflicting claims that in 1897 he had found a large amount of gold in the desert. Lassiter claimed that he had found a very rich vein of gold on his travels, something he described as a vast gold-bearing reef in central Australia. According to Lassiter, he had been a young man of 17 when he rode by horse from Queensland to the gold fields of Western Australia. On the way, he came across the Reef of Gold somewhere between the border of the Northern Territory and WA. He believed he was some 1,100 kilometres west of Alice Springs in line with Kalgoorlie. Lassiter got into some kind of trouble and was actually rescued by an Afghan camel driver. So that's pretty unusual in and of itself. Over the next several decades, Lassiter tried on several occasions to raise funds and find the gold reef, but he was never successful. When the gold rush finished in 1930, during the Great Depression, Lassiter was able to secure 50,000 pound for an expedition to the reef. Their search party included motorized transport, aircraft, and several experienced bushmen, but they never found it. The myth continues today and has become a prominent Australian folktale. Nobody knows if Lassiter was actually telling the truth and most likely we'll never find out. But if anybody has any stories about Lassiter's lost reef, I would love to hear it, so drop it in the comment section below. Number six, the shadowy family murders. The family was a name given to a mysterious group of men who were thought to be behind the kidnapping, drugging, torture and sexual abuse of young men and teenagers in Adelaide in the 1970s and 1980s. Five young men were murdered in the state between 1979 and 1983, and many of the police suspects had high profile occupations, which led to some conspiracy. Some experts have suggested these murders were not the only ones and were merely a part of a larger string of kidnappings and sexual assaults of boys and young men at the time. Victims were 16-year-old Alan Barnes, 25-year-old Neil Murr, 14-year-old Peter Stogneth, 18-year-old Mark Langley and 15-year-old Richard Kelvin. Bodies were found in each case, although little could be determined from Peter Stogneth's murder, the other four all died of massive blood loss from the indecent assaults that were inflicted upon them by their kidnappers. Police believed that as many as 12 people were involved in the killings, including a number of high profile individuals. Despite this, four of the five murders remain unsolved, with only one person jailed in the murder of Richard Kelvin, a man named Bevan Spencer von Einem. And if he's familiar to you, he will have come up in the Eloise Whirledge case, which is available to watch on Missing Down Under, and I will link it below. Einem was also the last person to be seen with Neil Murr after his abduction, and he is currently serving life in prison. A $1 million reward has been offered for any information that leads to conviction in the other cases. And again, you can call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Number seven, the man on the crucifix. Fisherman Mark Peterson was out on the Hawkesbury River in August of 1994 when he felt a strong tug on his fishing net. It was a lovely day and Mark was convinced that he had snagged a decent haul. Unfortunately, what he pulled up from the water was not fish at all, but a heavy piece of steel in the shape of a crucifix and attached to it were the remains of a person. Peterson rang the police in shock and they took possession of the remains and the crucifix. Forensic pathologists found that the remains were indeed of a human male aged between the years of 21 and 41, and the body had been intentionally arranged on the crucifix. The entirety of the body was wrapped in plastic, including the head, and there was wire wrapped around the head and the torso of the victim. Unfortunately, due to the erosion of fingerprints, the man couldn't be identified. Called the Rack Man by the media, he remains a mystery to this day, although the case hasn't been closed by the police. 
Some believe he might be a drug dealer who went missing in 1993, but that is yet to be proven. Number eight, the disappearance of Sarah McDermott. Sarah McDermott was on a train home in July of 1990 after playing tennis with friends. She was traveling back from East Melbourne back to Cannanook, where she had left her vehicle. And this was where she would disappear without a trace. Her friends left the train at Bond Beach, leaving Sarah alone. She was last seen getting off the train at Cannanook Station and heading to her car in the car park at 10.20 p.m. Police investigating the disappearance found bloodstains on the ground beside her 1978 Honda Civic, which had been left in the station's car park. They also noted that there were drag marks that led into the bushes. There they found a cigarette lighter belonging to Sarah. And those were the only clues left for police. A massive air, sea and land search was conducted over three weeks with more than 250 police personnel involved, but nothing was uncovered. Later, appeals for information uncovered two witnesses who reported they had heard a woman at the station yell, give me back my keys. A $1 million reward is current for any information that solves the case. And again, if you know anything about what happened to this lady, please call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Number nine, the vanishing Cessna 210. In August of 1981, a Cessna 210 was registered to travel from Proserpine to Sydney. Four passengers are on board, along with the 52 year old pilot Michael Hutchins, no relation to the NXS singer. The plane numbered VH-MDX sent out a radio transmission to air traffic control as they neared the community of Taree. According to the pilot, bad weather was ahead and he needed permission to fly in a restricted area to avoid the storm. Then the pilot actually would change his mind and stayed his original course. Not long after that, an integral part of the plane fails leaving the pilot with no sense of direction or horizon simulator or heading indicator. Along with strong winds and ice, and as well as the plane malfunction, there was extreme turbulence. The last response from Hutchins was terrified and cut short, 5,000, and the plane was never seen again. A number of exhaustive land and air searches were conducted involving police, rescuers and volunteers, but no trace of the aircraft or the men were found. Exactly what happened on board and what happened to the plane remains a mystery to this day. And last but not least, and probably our most compelling mystery on our list today, is that of the Summerton Man. The Summerton Man is probably one of the most internationally renowned of Australia's unsolved mysteries sometimes also referred to as the Taman Shud case. It involves the discovery of a man's body on Somerton Beach in the morning of December 1, 1948. The case is referred to as such because some months after the body was found, police uncovered a scrap of paper in the man's pocket on which was printed Tam M Shud. The phrase means ended or finished in Persian. Police were unable to identify the man, although his autopsy suggested that he had not died of natural causes, but had in fact been poisoned and possibly left at the beach instead of having died there. Clues on his body seemed to lead to more questions and it didn't get any easier when his suitcase was discovered six weeks after his body at a train station. The scrap of paper in his pocket came from a rare New Zealand edition of a book of poems, which police had tracked down and they had found that somebody had stashed it in the rear footwell of a car, of all places. Inside, they found indentations of other writing, which they believed to be either a code or an encryption. The case of the Summerton Man is considered to be one of Australia's most profound mysteries and has been since it was uncovered. Years later, there is no consensus as to who the man was, how he really died, or how he came to be at Somerton Beach, or where he might have come from. A local woman named Jessica Thompson was linked to the case, but continued to claim she did not know the dead man. Some think that he might have been a spy, but the truth is, after all these years, we will probably never know.
And that is where we leave our list of Australia's top 10 unsolved mysteries. So what do you guys think? What do you think could possibly have happened to these people? I'd love to know your theories, so please put them in the comment section below. Also, if you have your own scary story that you would love me to cover here on the channel, I'd be really happy to do that. You may remain anonymous if you would like, and the email for that will be linked in the description below as well. It is our email for Clarence Valley Paranormal, or if you have a site that you would like us to investigate as a team with Clarence Valley Paranormal, you can send that to the email as well. And that's going to do it for today. I would love to thank you all so, so much again for watching. I simply appreciate each and every one of you so much because without you, I can't get further ahead on YouTube. And as I mentioned before, I am trying to get into the partnership program and I will need a thousand of you to help me do that. So if you're not subscribed yet, it would mean the world to me if you could just take two seconds out of your day to subscribe. It only takes a second and it's free and you're gonna get lots of terrific content from me and from my team at Clarence Valley Paranormal here on the channel. So that's gonna do it for today, like I said. Much love to everybody. Have a beautiful day. Please stay safe and I will see you all back here very soon. And it's goodbye from Oogie and from Charlie and from Louie, wherever he has taken himself off to. And uh, we will see you again soon. Bye.